I'm Maria Vasquez, Vice President for Student Affairs at Metropolitan Community College, and it is my pleasure to welcome today Christine Chavez, Community Organizer and Farm Worker Coordinator for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Good morning. Good morning. Good How are morning. you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy that you're here I'm today with to us. I'm happy to be here. It's my first time in Omaha. Oh, welcome. So welcome. Excited to be here. So you're here today because we are celebrating a Cinco de Mayo here at Metropolitan Community College, our 19th year uh, celebrating. Um, and so you will be our keynote speaker. So tell me a little bit about what that might look like today for our audience. Um, well, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, why my grandfather started the United Farm Workers. What are some of the things I felt that the UFW did that made the organization so long lasting and sustainable for so many years, even continues today. And then just talk a little bit about um, Mexican Americans that were here before, you know, that um, uh, that were here before and sort of laid the groundwork for us to be as successful. So your grandfather was Cesar Chavez. Yes. So um, share some experiences and that you remember and some life lessons that you learned from yeah. him and his work. I think from uh, an early age, it was my mom Sylvia, his oldest daughter who really um, wanted us to be involved with, you know, with everything that had to do with the farm workers. So we lived up in Northern California near the Salinas Valley, which is sort of the, people call it the lettuce, the salad bowl capital oh. of the world. That's where lots of our um, fresh uh, vegetables are grown. And um, every time my grandfather would come from the Central Valley up to Northern California, we would join him. He'd come pick us up. We would join him at marches in the Salinas Valley or in Watsonville or we, he would take us sometimes to San Francisco to show his support for different issues going on in the cities as well. So it was always important um, for our entire family to be involved with the, with the farm workers. So from a young age, you were involved, your whole family. Oh yeah. Which oh, yeah. your mom, Silvia, and then other siblings as well. Yes, she's, and just everyone. Yes, they had mm -hmm. eight. Uh, my grandmother, uh, Helen and Caesar, they had eight children and you know, all of their children and then all of my 31 cousins were always involved and we would always go to all the marches together or you know we'd go in front of supermarkets and hand out leaflets about whatever boycott was going on or what issue um, was going on and it was just um, it was just important for my grandfather um, to see his family also out there on the picket lines or mm -hmm. at the marches and just of showing course. support for farm workers of course tell us a little bit about you um, I mentioned your titles, but uh, tell us a little bit about what you do, and I believe you're, you live in the D.C. area. Actually, we just moved back. Okay. So we lived in D.C. for about, gosh, for about eight years, um, my husband Oscar and I. And my husband Oscar was an Obama appointee for those eight years, also working at the Department of Agriculture in a different sector. Um, and I started at USDA as a farm worker coordinator, and then I transitioned to work with our Natural Resources Conservation Service. So we work with small, um, minority, um, veteran-owned, women-owned um, farmers. Uh, and what we've noticed in California is that we see a lot of farm workers who, you know, worked in the fields for many years are now starting to purchase their own farms and, you know, start these small businesses. And so we're there to help them sort of conserve any of their natural resources, be it, you know, using less pesticides, how to use your irrigation mm. systems more effectively. And so um, it's a really fulfilling job just for the fact that I think a lot of, uh, whether it's, you know, the Korean farmers or the Hmong farmers or the Latino farmers, there's a huge language barrier there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they weren't coming into our offices at USDA to ask for services. So they hired two outreach coordinators, myself and my coworker, Victor Hernandez, to go out there and let them know about our grants and loans and all of our different resources that we have to help farmers grow their businesses. And so it's been very successful. The farmers have been very receptive. And so we're, So we're you recently moved back. We recently yeah. moved back, yes. Okay. So we live in Davis, California, which is um, right between Sacramento and San Francisco. Okay. It's an agricultural area. Okay. And yeah. So you continue to do some work with your entire family around civil rights, around oh, yeah. farm workers. Yes, yes. yes. Um, actually, it was just uh, around March 31st, my grandfather's birthday. Mm -hmm. um, we went to marches in Salinas. We went to a march in San Francisco. Uh, where else did we go? We went to, they do a big dinner, a Cesar Chavez dinner, like a fundraising dinner out in Los Angeles. And so we sort of 
bopped around to all these different places. Um, at, you know, what we call Cesar Chavez week, that right. March 31st. So, right. but it's always a great time because it's always, um, you know, good to be around the farm workers to hear about some of the issues that are going on with them and to hear mm -hmm. about some of the challenges that are, you know, that they're facing right now because oh. of the climate that we're in. Well, it's an honor to have you here and to hear your a little bit about your story, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that at the luncheon. Yeah. Um, how would you like people to remember your grandfather yeah. and his work? And and again, I say that because it really does sound like a whole family. It wasn't just your grandfather, Cesar Chavez. Yeah. It was probably your grandmother, Helen, and yes. of course your your mom, Sylvia, yeah. and uh, Liz, yes. and all the yes. other aunts yes. that and uncles. So talk to us about, you know, how would you like, how do you think, um, you would like people to remember yeah. your grandfather's legacy or your family's yeah. legacy, really. Yeah, thank you for bringing up my grandmother, Helen. Um, she is, um, she passed away about two years ago now, and she was really the backbone of our family. She, you know, when my grandfather started the UFW, my grandmother went back to go work in the field so that, um, you know, because he quit working for the community service organization where he was getting a steady paycheck. My grandmother went to go work back in the fields to help sustain the family while he started this organization. And um, I think my grandmother doesn't get a lot of credit, um, but I think without her walking side by side with him, he wouldn't have been as successful as he was. Um, and that goes really for the entire family as well and a lot of the sacrifices that mm -hmm. they had to make. Um, but I would want people to know that um, just because my grandfather has passed on, mm -hmm. that there's still a movement today. There's still many issues that farm workers and just the immigrant community in large is going through, especially right now, mm -hmm. that I would want people to continue to support the farm workers, continue to support um, you know, different immigrant rights organizations. And um, my grandfather said he wouldn't have worked a day in his life if he didn't, if he didn't think the movement would continue without him mm -hmm. um, because he always wanted the focus to be on the farm worker. So I think today wouldn't be any different and he'd want people to um, continue. You know, to continue, absolutely. La lucha. Exactly. Si se puede. Si se puede. Um, so I met your, one of your aunts about a year ago when I was in California, and it was um, a great experience visiting with Liz and uh, your Uncle David. Um, but it sounds like there's still a lot of work that perhaps the foundation yes. they're doing there in Bakersfield, Delano. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about what, the, what okay. that's about. So um, David and Liz run the Farm Worker Institute for Education Leadership Development. So they help farm workers. They go out to the field to recruit farm workers to, and help them get their GED, mm -hmm. maybe help them um, if they would like to transition from working in the fields to doing some other work. They sort of serve as like a, a liaison between, between uh, you know, farm work and helping them get their education. So mm -hmm. it started very small and now it's grown and there's, you know, they're working all over the state of California trying to get farm workers, you know, uh, to get their GED, to learn English, which will help open, you know, other opportunities for them. And then um, the Cesar Chavez Foundation, uh, that is different than the United Farm Workers. Um, the foundation helps build affordable housing all over, uh, mostly California, but they're also starting to branch out to Texas and um, Arizona. Um, they also run a network of radio stations called mm. Radio Campesina mm. um, in Washington. Number one station is in Arizona and all throughout California. So it serves as a plays like the latest, you know, hits uh, Spanish music. But then it also um, serves as an educational um, tool for farm workers to learn about different things that are going on in the mm -hmm. community as well. Mm -hmm. So and then, of course, United Farm Workers continues to organize um, farm workers, um, let them know about their rights. Um, most recently in California, we were able to pass um, uh, farm workers for the first time ever will get um, overtime, which has been a oh. long time coming. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that we've worked on for years. And finally, the governor last or two years ago signed legislation so that farm workers will get overtime now, like every other worker. Very so, good. Yeah. yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. Absolutely. But that is a win, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, you are a civil rights advocate. Um, so how, and I know you've worked on several campaigns. Um, how do you determine which candidate? Um, tell, talk to us about the whole yeah. process and how to get involved. And of course, your family's been involved right. for quite some time. But if somebody out there is, is watching, how, do, how does somebody yeah. get started in the whole right. supporting a, a candidate yeah. in the whole well, campaign think, process? I think for me and um, 
uh, sort of my network, I think we look at candidates that are, that are gonna support issues that we care about. So for me, I always look at where are they on immigration reform? Where are they on the issue of choice? Where are they on the issue of um, you know, access to access to education for for all. Mm -hmm. um, so those are just issues that I look at, and I want to make sure that that candidate is in line with some of the issues that that I care about. Um, and then um, definitely the United Farm Workers endorses candidates, um, and so we've worked on behalf and we've taken farm workers, you know, to Denver, to Texas, um, you know, of course, all throughout California to work on different candidates that we know. You know, when these farm workers come through the halls of, you know, of uh, Congress, that there's going to be people that are going to be supportive to farm worker issues. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just encourage people to, um, you know, to get involved. You, I mean, it can, all politics is local, right? To get involved mm -hmm. in your local school board races or your city council races. Um, and look at those candidates and, you know, make sure that they're in line with issues that you care about. Uh, my grandfather always used to say, we don't need perfect political system, but we need perfect participation, mm. meaning that everybody needs to participate. Like, we need to go out and vote. It takes five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's something that he always encouraged people uh, to get involved in. Sure, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll use that. Yes. Um, so you um, not only focus on migrant workers, but you mentioned inclusivity and equity in all, really, areas of uh, uh, issues of choice, et cetera. Tell okay. us a little bit more about how those are cross-sectional or intersect yeah. uh, with all really civil right movements. Right. Well, one of the things that I think um, that I mentioned to you what I was gonna talk to the group about is I think the UFW in the early days and today was so successful because they really built a broad coalition yeah. with other civil rights groups, um, especially with the African American community. The the black community were some of the first leaders, whether it was um, you know Congressman John Lewis or Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, they were some of the first leaders to open up the doors to the black churches and let my grandfather and farm workers come in and talk to the, their congregations about about the boycotts and about what's going on with farm worker issues. Mm -hmm. And in turn, we supported, you know, African American issues, knowing that it's really the same issues mm -hmm. that we're all talking about. Access to good jobs, educational opportunities, you know, battling police brutality together. Um, another group that my grandfather worked very closely with back in the 70s, which was controversial for that time, was the gay and lesbian community. He formed a strong uh, relationship with, um, with Harvey Milk, mm. and Harvey Milk really opened up the doors in San Francisco to the gay community there. And you know, for years, they supported our boycotts and our marches and uh, many other of our, of our campaigns. And we still have that relationship today that, that continues um, with the LGBT community. So I think for an organization to be sustainable, long-lasting, you really have to build a diverse coalition of, of folks, um, you know, bring them into, mm -hmm. into your movement and reciprocate. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked a little bit, I'm backing up, you said something about your grandmother, Helen, who was really the backbone. Talk to us and share a little bit more stories about Helen and her work while yeah. the, the, the movement was really, yeah. you know, in the at, at its prime, I guess I'd say. Yeah, she um, very opposite than my grandfather. My grandfather was very soft spoken, mm -hmm. um, you know, a strict vegan vegetarian. Uh, didn't watch TV except for the news, and my grandmother totally opposite. Loved steak, loved her novellas. Like you could always tell when she was watching a novella, and we'd call, and she'd be all, uh huh, uh huh. I'm like, are you watching Distracted. a novella? Exactly. Like, can you call me back? I'm like. Really? Um, but she really, um, you know, always encouraged us to get involved with mm. everything and would be so excited when we would be out on one of the campaigns. You know, she'd call us all the time, how's it going? What's going on? You know, when we would lose some of these campaigns, she was like, it's okay. You know how many times we've lost? It's not about, you know, losing. It's about what you do after and how you mm. continue to keep going. Um, but I think for all of my cousins, she's really, um, you know, losing her was just a, um, a tremendous loss because right. she was so intimately involved with all of our lives and mm -hmm. everything that we were doing and wanted to know about, you know, 
Wait, where were you going? What, how's your job? Mm. And was, you know, not just me, with all of my 31 cousins. 31 cousins, yeah. she knew what she was knew going everything. on with yeah. everybody. We'd go to her, if she, so she was very, you know, not traditional because she was, you know, when we would tell her, we're gonna get arrested for civil disobedience, she'd be, yay! You know, very <laughs> not traditional grandma, but then very traditional, and we'd come to her home, and. Um, you know, whatever we wanted. You uh -huh. know, our favorite meal was always prepared for us. She was mm. a wonderful cook. And, um, you know, she really uh, stood right there by my grandfather for so many years. Mm. And so it was, uh, like I said, it was a huge loss to, to lose her. But um, we know that she's with my grandfather now. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, another woman, Dolores Huerta, Tell us a little bit about yes. your experience with Dolores. Um, she's still very active. Oh, very active. Fearless. Yes. Uh, Dolores Huerta, um, for viewers that know, is the co founder of United Farm Workers. And Dolores um, has been out on so many issues, right out in the forefront, also. Um, back in the day, she was a fierce negotiator when she'd have to sit across and negotiate with some of the largest growers mm. in California. Um, they were more scared of her than they were of my grandfather. Um, and today she continues to advocate, you know, for women's rights, for issues of choice, for definitely for immigrant rights and some of the things that we see going on now. Um, she, uh, you know, if she was here, she'd want to go out, go see Omaha till two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> see what's going on, go talk to people. And she, I always say, oh, she can out, stay out later than anybody else, <laughs> even at her, you know, 86 maybe 87 year old mm. uh, person, she's still going strong and still yeah. continues to be an advocate for so many um, issues. Yes, so, she is. Yeah. She's And her daughters amazing. now, they run the uh, Dolores Huerta Foundation where they organize in, um, in communities around different issues um, and they uh, encourage people to uh, Google Dolores Huerta Foundation, see what, she's go what they have going on. Mm. Her daughter Camila and Juanita, she's 11 children. Oh. And so she's got a doctor, one's a doctor, one's a lawyer. They've got community organizers, teachers, somebody's a filmmaker, a rapper, a chef. Um, but she's, you know, all of her children continue to stay very involved with their communities as well. Yeah. So as we celebrate Cinco de Mayo, um, oftentimes people believe that's you know, um, Mexico's Independence Day, yeah. um, when it's really a battle, the Battle yeah. of Puebla, yes. that we celebrate. Um, but talk to us about what, growing up, what, what were some of the things that you did in California to celebrate yeah. Cinco de Mayo, or the Asisees, the yes. Septiembre? Well, you know what I've noticed is that in different parts of California, Cinco de Mayo is celebrated more. So I think mm -hmm. where we grew up in the northern part, like mm -hmm. in San Jose, San Francisco, it is a huge celebration. Um, and I think that may have to do because it seems more of like a Mexican American holiday. Mm. Um, but then where my husband grew up in East Los Angeles, it's marked, but not as much as the ACCS, mm. where it Which is, is the, the Independence, Independence Day, Day, September 16th. It's a huge celebration yeah. in East Los Angeles. There's thousands of people that come out. Mm. They have a huge parade. They've done it for, you know, for years and years and years. So I definitely, you know, that'd be something good to, to I'd want to understand why is there that, and I, I, I think it maybe has to do with more um, sort of a Chicano scene um, mm. uh, holiday in Northern, where there tends to be more, um, you know, second, third, fourth generation okay. versus more of immigrants in East Los Angeles. Okay. Um, but um, for that us, you know, there, right? Yeah. I, I yeah. think I'm uh -huh. like, hmm, what is that? Um, but for us, um, they used to have a parade in downtown San Jose, and so we'd go out there and march with the farm workers and mm. pass out leaflets about whatever campaign was going on at the time. And for us, it was also just a time to celebrate, mm. you know, our culture and share it with others right. as well. Um, when I was doing some research here, um, I just Googled um, Omaha and Mexican Americans. And I just wanted to see what, what came up so I can see, you know, just sort of the connection there. And so there was a gentleman named Hector Garcia who started the American GI Forum. Mm -hmm. And that was an organization that, um, that helped get uh, Mexican American veterans some of the same, uh, you know, uh, some of the same opportunities that veterans were getting when they were coming back. So Hector was a, um, was a doctor, he served in the Navy, but he got his residency here, he did his residency here at Creighton University. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, oh, good. Yeah. yeah. So I and so when I was looking at Creighton, they were saying notable people. So we're gonna have to reach out to them and let them know to put Hector <laughs> Garcia on there as yes, well. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was very interesting. That's still a very. Um, energizing group, uh, the American GI Forum. Yes. And uh, so it's it's one of our, um, very proud of that organization and the work that they are, they've done and For are still sure. doing. For sure. Yes. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And it grew, you know, to so many, it started in, in, it started in Texas and then it grew to Arizona and to California. Mm. And so, yeah. There's also a, a group or an agency, the it, Chicano Awareness Center. It is now the Latino Center of the Midlands, and they also are doing a lot of great work in the community oh, with wow. uh, Latino, Chicano, Mexican American families, or other Hispanics. So, and and it's a cross section of just really supporting, uplifting others um, that just need assistance. You oh, know, social great. services or education, those sorts of things. Oh, good. I'll have to look that up. Yes. Also. Um, you mentioned Chicano or the term Chicano. Can you talk a little bit about some of the terms that, that maybe you grew up with, yeah. a Mexican American, Chicano? Now yeah. I'm hearing more of Latin X. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on? Um, you know, the growing terms? up, we were always, you know, Mexicans, uh -huh. just Mexican. It wasn't until we went to college and we met people from Mexico, and they're like, you're not Mexican, mm -hmm. you're Mexican-American, or you're Chicano. But I, we, I'd heard, of course, heard the term Chicano. Um, like, my husband calls himself a Chicano. Mm -hmm. I tend to say Latina. Um, it's funny, we were both at, uh, at, we live right by UC Davis, mm -hmm. and we were there supporting, they were having a, uh, I think it, they were doing some sort of fundraiser for one of the Mecha groups there. Uh -huh. And so we went to go support them. And the first time we heard Latin X, and my husband kept, we're like, why are they, what is that? What are they saying? And so we went and looked it mm -hmm. up, and then we saw, and my husband was like, I'm not ever going to say that. I'm just going to say Latino, Latina, or I'm going to say Chicano. Uh -huh. But yeah, I think it's just a preference. And I remember people, um, I don't, I don't, I think my grandfather, when people would ask him, he would always say Mexican also, even though he was born in Arizona. But that was his, yeah, I don't, I don't think I, ever heard him say mm. Chicano, but, you know, obviously that's a right. term that was used very widely, especially, um, you know, uh, in East Los Angeles and some, when it, as the movement started taking off mm -hmm. there as well. Mm -hmm. So so you said the movement is still alive. Um, yeah. It looks differently today than it did perhaps back then For in the sure. 60s or 70s. So um, what does that look like yeah. today? I mean, there's still marches, there's still, yeah. you know, that sort of, of action. Right. But what else um, are you seeing that's a little different than what it used to be like? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things today versus back in when Dolores and my grandfather um, started organizing is that a lot of the workers that were in the fields were, were um, citizens. Mm -hmm. And now today, 80% of people that, you know, bring, put food on our tables that we all benefit from you know, um, are not are not citizens, and so that with that creates a lot of fear, a lot of um, resistance for people to call out their employers when they're not paid a living wage, when there's not access to shade or mm. bathrooms. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, especially within the last two years, what we're seeing in in California is a lot of people just pulling back from really participating in their communities, not mm -hmm. wanting to, um, you know, picking their children up from school and taking them directly home, not wanting to be involved in all the different activities that other mm -hmm. parents are involved in, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. um, out in um, Delano, California, um, just this year there was an incident um, where a man and a wife were um, taking, actually they were going to look for work um, there are farm workers going to, sometimes they'll just hire people on the spot. So they were going to look for work and they notice an ICE van following them. They mm -hmm. are undocumented. They have eight kids, six or eight kids. They took off and they, um, they crashed and both the mom and the dad had died. Mm -hmm. And leaving, you know, these six children, uh, my cousin Natalie is a, just happens to be at the school where two of the children attend. She's a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, her and the school rallied around the family and, you know, helped them, you know, get in contact with all the appropriate people to, you know, do the burial services, mm -hmm. to help send the bodies back to Mexico, um, and to help these kids, you know, sort of, you know, move forward right. after such a tragedy like this. But you're, you're just starting to see more and more people, um, you know, 
uh, farm workers just afraid, mm. afraid. And so we are, UFW's been holding, you know, numerous town halls and meetings to let people know what are your rights. Mm. Um, and, you know, we would really hope that, you know, some of these employers, these larger employers would also get involved in that because without these workers, no one's eating. I mm -hmm. mean, that's just a fact. That is just a fact. Do you see the larger employers stepping up? Some, mm -hmm. some do. Um, I think some are trying to do the right thing, um, but uh, I would like to see them, you know, beating their chest more mm. and just saying, you know, if you're going to go after, like they want to go after people who are, you know, in this country and are doing bad things, it's not the farm workers. Uh -huh. They're working every day, 12 hours a day to put food on our tables. Everybody knows that they're undocumented. It's mm. been a secret for years. Um, it's really, uh, we'd really like to see um, other people stepping up to mm -hmm. protect these workers. Yeah. So there's really, um, you mentioned fear. Um, oh, yeah. It's, so within the last um, several months or year or so, I mean, I think there's perhaps more fear. Oh, for sure. Um, and, for sure. and so how do people then that are um, working and doing the work that you and, and your family and, and foundations are doing, you know, how do they then, how do we continue to um, work with communities that are filled with fear yeah. um, that, you know, you mentioned parents are picking their kids up from school and then going straight home. Yeah. And so we're encouraging activity and um, more engagement in the community. Um, all politics is local politics. Right. And how does then that transfer over to people and communities that are filled with fear? Yeah. I think you know, was there a question in there? I'm not yeah. Sure. Well, I think no. I think we have to continue to. Um, I think we have to continue to hold these um, these yeah. informational meetings so that people will know what their rights are mm. because people, nobody knows. You look at the news and um, people, you know, don't know. You mm -hmm. know what some of their rights are. So we've been partnering with the California Rural Legal Assistance. We've been partnering with the Dolores Huerta Foundation, with um, the Mexican American Legal Defense Education Fund, MALDEF. Um, just to continue to hold these 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 meetings, um, and you know what we tell people, and that is why we have to continue to participate in our electoral process and make mm -hmm. sure that we're electing people that are going to go after you know the bad people and aren't going to go after the low hanging fruit, which mm -hmm. are workers that are just trying to go to you mm -hmm. know trying to uh, trying to go to work. And it's not just here in California. I'll be very clear about that. You know, California has some of you know the looser laws like. Uh, undocumented folks are allowed to get driver's license in California, and that's not true everywhere. Right. I know in upstate uh, New York, we hear mm -hmm. a lot of instances up there where farm workers are just driving to work, and once you get pulled over and you don't have a driver's license, that mm. creates a whole another issue. Um, so I think it's about us electing people that are going to be um, sympathetic and uh, you know understand that these aren't jobs that people are taking, these mm -hmm. aren't jobs that, you know, that other people want to feel so quickly um, that you know these are people that just want to work. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. there's still a lot of a lot of work to do, but yes. there's still so much hope. Absolutely, um, for our future um, and future generations to come. So, for sure. thank you so much thank for being you. here in Omaha for today's Cinco de Mayo luncheon celebration with at Metropolitan Community College, and uh, continue with your work. And we look forward to seeing you again in Omaha. Thank you for Thanks, sure, Christine. Thank you.